Okay. Good evening, everyone, and thank you once again for joining us at our Fifth Avenue Synagogue Sunday night uh, lecture series. This evening, uh, once again, we have the honor to hear from Dr. Larry Norton. Uh, Dr. Norton is a senior vice president at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center and medical director of the Evelyn H. Lauder Breast Center. He is a founder of the Breast Cancer Research Foundation and has served on or chaired numerous medical related <coughs> committees. He also happens to be an accomplished musician. If we wanted, we could probably spend the entire time just going through his credentials and his achievements uh, because Dr. Norton basically has dedicated his entire life to the eradication of cancer through his research and his medical care, and in the process, bettering and saving the lives of many, many individuals. As this is the third time we have the opportunity to hear from Dr. Norton, just wanted to share with you one observation I had about him. The Gemara Megillah states, Kol makom sh'ata motzei gvuraso shal kadosh baruchu, ata motzei an visanuso. Which means whenever you find a reference in the Torah to the greatness of God, you also in the same exact location find a description of God's humility. Throughout the Torah, whenever there's a discussion of God's might and his power, there is also a mention about how humble God is side by side. And the Gemara is basically teaching us that personal greatness and achievement must always be coupled and balanced with humility and sensitivity. The more you advance in life, the more you must humble yourself at the very same time. And I think this uh, formula truly captures this evening's uh, presenter. Our speaker tonight most definitely achieved greatness in his life. He is at the top of his profession. Many people seek out his expertise and he has saved many lives. However, he somehow also remained to be humble and sensitive in the process. As Ezra Merkin, who introduced him last time, mentioned, Dr. Norton is as nice as he is smart. And I think what granted Dr. Norton this ability to maintain this balance of achievement and sensitivity at the same time is his understanding that as a doctor, he is just a messenger of the Almighty, who is the ultimate healer of all the sick. Dr. Norton brings his faith, faith with him to work. He studies Torah and attends synagogue regularly. He allows his emunah, his faith, to be his guide. And perhaps this understanding is what makes him so successful in life. He's a very busy man. And it's a great privilege for us that he took some time to address us this evening. We wish him and his family only good health and continued su success in all his endeavors. I also want to thank Lauren and Ezra Merkin for making the connection between uh, the synagogue and Dr. Norton and for arranging this evening's presentation. Thank you so much, Lauren and Ezra. And Dr. Norton will be discussing the current COVID-19 situation along with the uh, vaccine and all the other elements that we're all thinking mm -hmm. about uh, today. Dr. Norton, please. Well, Jew is rabbi. I mean, I mean, I find that touching and, and deeply embarrassing uh, your introduction. Um, but thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for your, for your kind thoughts. Um, uh, today, we're going to talk about, um, uh, I'm going to move my imagery over here so I can see my own slides. I'm going to talk about COVID. Um, you could talk about COVID for, COVID is the illness. It's not the virus, um, although the, the, the term is becoming interchangeable with the virus. Um, uh, it's uh, SARS-CoV-2. It's the novel coronavirus um, that's related to the SARS virus, although it's, it's it, because they're both coronaviruses. Uh, COVID is actually the illness that's caused by it, but people have been using it you know, interchangeably. So it's become the, uh, the common way that we're talking about it. Um, you could talk about it really uh, for, for hundreds of hours and not exhaust the topic now. And I think people for many centuries will be talking about this particular pandemic. Uh, so we can only touch a few of the topics that I think uh, that I hope would be relevant to you in your lives and, and your interest as, uh, and I would leave as much time as I possibly can uh, to, uh, to questions because that's where we really get to what's really uh, on your mind and what's really important to you. So what I'd like to talk about is just kind of the state of where we are right now with COVID. 
talk about risk assessment uh, and and who is at highest risk, and we'll talk about what that what that really means, uh, you know, going forward as well. Talk about where we are with both therapy and prevention, and uh, the major bulk of my talk will be about uh, vir vaccines and um, and how we uh, what the current state of the art is with the vaccines and where that's going. And then also introduce at the end a little a, a few new ideas, some of the work that that uh, that I've been doing on this on this, on this topic. Um, uh, and, and I will say in full disclosure, I'm also an advisor to one of the vaccine companies, and I'll tell you about that as, as we go forward. But with full disclosure, that, that's something that uh, it's important for me to say. Um, where we are is we're in serious trouble. <laughs> um, uh, I mean, this is, uh, you know, potentially a cataclysmic uh, thing that we're dealing with. I mean, we, we, we suffered in New York in April, and you can see where the number of cases were in April. And it sort of settled down sort of nationally. Um, there was a big surge uh, nationally in, in the summer. Um, uh, and now going into the winter, as everybody expected, um, it's increasing. I don't think anybody really expected it would be increasing at the rate. Uh, th this is actually uh, Friday before Shabbos' report. Um, it's, it's much worse this morning. I didn't change my slides. Um, uh, you know, more than 14 million people have been affected so far. Uh, just, in, you know, every day we're exceeding 200. Uh, 200,000 new infections. Uh, the death rate is, is approaching 3,000 patients a day. So that's the 9-11 uh, catastrophe every day. Um, and it's increasing. Um, now it's increasing, starting to explode because of the Thanksgiving holiday and people traveling to see their families. False confidence in testing. Um, uh, uh, we can talk about that. I didn't talk about testing uh, in this talk just to save time, but if there's questions about that, I, I just want to plant the idea False confidence in testing is, is part of the, the cause of, of, of the crisis that we're having post Thanksgiving. And of course, people will be traveling Hanukkah and, and, uh, and Christmas, the bulk of the American population traveling for Christmas and, and visiting family. We're expecting a surge on top of a surge on top of a surge. Um, to give you some idea, the share of the population uh, that had a reported case so far in the United States um, uh, is there's no place in the United States that doesn't have a lot of cases per, per population. Uh, you see some places, uh, it's, it's just unbelievable, like the Dakotas, um, uh, in terms of what percentage of people um, uh, have, uh, what percentage of people in the population have had cases proportional to the population. But what's most important is if you look at the actual number of cases, this is in the last week, um, uh, you know, all over the country. Um, this is what is consuming the medical establishment. Uh, people get sick with COVID. Most people don't get very sick or they don't think they get very sick because they get better acutely. Um, but a significant percentage end up in the hospital and a significant percentage of those end up in the intensive care unit and a significant percentage of those go on to die. Um, and we'll talk about risk predictions because there's a lot of young people that don't think they're at very high risk. And so they, they, they're not paying attention to the public health rules, and um, and this is really this is really disastrous. But there's senior adults also. There are adults that are not playing, paying attention to the to the simple rules of how not to get sick with an infection. So there's no part of the country that's really free of this, and and this is a huge problem in and of itself because in uh, April and May we're able to move personnel around uh, to hotspots, but now the entire country is a hotspot, and therefore uh, the people have to fend for themselves. So um, it's really bad. I mean, and there's no way of saying, saying anything other than that, and there's no way of, uh, of, uh, of decreasing the intensity of the, uh, of the crisis that we're really following. Now, if you get sick with COVID, uh, most people don't get very sick. Um, uh, although when I say don't, don't get very sick, when you talk to people who recover from COVID, they say it was about the worst flu that they ever had, uh, you know, with severe pain and difficulty with breathing and, and, and crushing, you know, headaches making them scream scream, but they, they, they were able to recover from it without having to get hospitalized. But that the risk of hospitalization, the, the major risk of hospitalization is um, uh, age. And uh, there are children that get hospitalized, and even people that are young in their 30s and 40s are getting hospitalized. Um, I'm taking the, this is relative risk, um, I'm taking the, uh, the 18 to 29 year old group as a relative risk of one. Uh, if you're 84 years old, it's 13 times that risk of getting hospitalized. Uh, people 50, 50 to 84, as you can see, very significant, you know, increase in the probability of getting hospitalized if you um, get sick. And you get hospitalized because you're very ill, mostly because you can't breathe and, um, and you require oxygen support. And in some cases, you require intubation and being put on a machine. But people in the 30 to 39 age group um, and people in the 18 to 39 age group 
still are getting very, very sick. And, um, and, and, and they're coming in, into, into the hospital and they're dying. It's about 20% of the people getting sick are ending up hospitalized. And, and uh, of those, probably about a quarter are dying of the disease. So it's not trivial. It's not a trivial number of people. And beside that, um, if you do get sick um, and you get better, one third of people who, who, who get through an episode of COVID have long lasting symptoms. And people ask me, how long will the symptoms last? And the answer is we don't know. And we've had people with symptoms now for many months that are not going away. Severe headaches, for example, lethargy, difficulty in concentration. Um, and so we don't know what the long-term health consequences of that are. Um, uh, and this is serious because it's an RNA virus. It gets into your cells and it changes your genome. It changes your DNA and, and doesn't go away. Um, stays there forever. And so those headaches may be a progressive sign of brain damage. Um, shortness of breath may be a progressive sign of heart and lung damage. So we haven't seen the full impact of this, of this pandemic uh, by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, and, uh, and so even the young people that say, hey, you know, it's just a bad cold, I get over it. It may not be a bad cold for you. And also you could also transmit it, you can give it to other people. And, um, and so its impact on our whole society and our whole culture and our whole economic structure is also very profound and that does affect you as an individual. Um, relative risk of death, again, dramatically increases with age. And this is really astronomical. If you're taking that 18 to 29 year age group as one, you've got over a 600 times chance of dying uh, if you get COVID if you're older than 84 years old. And you see over 200 time, time, 220 is actually the number if you're 75 to, to 84. Um, uh, and so these are the acute deaths, uh, but the long-term health damage is something that we just don't know yet. Um, now, there are other risk factors that, that are important here beside age. And the three biggest ones are these. One is obesity. And obesity uh, is measured by something called the body mass index. You can figure it out for yourself. Plenty of places on the internet where you can just put in your, your height and weight and it'll tell you what your body mass index is. Um, most Americans are overweight. They have between 25 and 30, um, uh, but a significant percentage of Americans are obese with, with a um, body mass index over 30. Um, and, and the risk of severe COVID is increased um, uh, in the obese uh, and, and greater category by threefold on top of what your risks are related to your age. So it's an independent risk factor. Um, it, it's not, and, and, and has, it has that, that impact. Uh, high blood pressure is also a significant risk factor and cardiovascular disease in general, but particularly high blood pressure and diabetes. 90% of diabetes is type two, which is adult onset, which is closely related to obesity, but that it's, um, uh, it, and we used to think that it was just basically the those we had to worry about, but the, the younger people with diabetes, what they call type 1, used to be called juvenile diabetes, um, also are at high risk. And we should keep these in mind, all these factors, whatever your other factors are related to your age, they increase it by threefold. And we should keep this in mind because when I end this talk, I'm going to come back to this and talk about a, a potential reason why and something that we can pay attention to. So this is, if, if I've scared you, I've tried to, <laughs> because the fact of the matter is, is it doesn't have to be this way. So this is a picture of a bar in South Dakota. In South Dakota, it's, it's actually approaching 50% of the population uh, are, are either um, are carrying, are carrying uh, of the asymptomatic population uh, have been exposed to the virus or actually carrying the virus. That's half of South Dakota. This is a bar scene in South Dakota and it's everything you could do wrong if you're trying to avoid catching a viral disease. Now, a viral disease could be a cold, one third of all colds are caused by coronaviruses. They're not obviously as severe as, as, as SARS-2, but um, any, any, any virus, it's, it's crowds of people, so you're in contact with lots of people. It's doing it indoors, so the air is not circulating. It's spending a lot of time close to those people and spending a lot of time close to those people and it's spreading the virus by, by respiration. It's coming out of your lungs uh, and it can come out of your mouth, it can come out of your nose. It comes out when you are um, breathing. It comes out when you're talking. It comes out when you're singing. Um, uh, singing turns out to be a very particularly good way to actually project the virus. Uh, you know, it, it, it turns out, and we know this from, from, from studies that have actually demonstrated um, super spreader events related to people being in close contact and singing. And so avoiding crowds, trying to stay outdoors if you have to meet people as much as possible. Um, uh, and, and keeping, keeping a distance, um, avoiding close contact with people for long distances, and, and by all means wearing a mask is what you have to do. 
And if you do these things, um, uh, if you do these things, it just makes a difference. Now, I want to explain something that is not totally apparent to people. People are saying, okay, listen, you're saying that the, the asymptomatic population uh, of, of my region is only 5% or so. Let's say 2, 3, 4, 5% of people are testing positive in the asymptomatic population. I mean, that's not a very high percentage. Anybody in meat, there's a 95% chance that they're not carrying the virus. So why am I at risk? Why, why are crowds bad, in other words? And it simply is because if you meet one person, you're at a five, let's say at a 5% positive test rate. If you're meeting one person, yes, you know, you only have a 5% chance you're going to be exposed. But if you meet 10 people, the odds that everybody, all, each of those 10 people are going to be negative, all right, um, is, uh, is, is such that there's a 40% chance that you're going, to be, you're going to be exposed by one of those 10 people. It's only six. It's 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 basically a um. Uh, it's only a sixty percent chance that all ten of them are going to be negative, because it's it's ninety five times ninety five times ninety five ten times. Twenty people, you're approaching a sixty percent chance that you're going to be exposed to, uh, to the virus, and uh, when when ninety five percent of the people are free of the virus, ninety five percent are free of the virus, but you meet twenty people, and your chances of being exposed are greater than sixty percent. If you go to a situation that's more common for many other parts of the country where 10% of people are, are testing positive, um, you know, eight to 10% of people testing positive, um, yeah, you meet one person, there's a 90% chance you're not gonna be exposed. By the time you meet 20 people, it's, it's almost a 90% chance that somebody you've met um, has the virus and you can catch it from them by being close to them and, and not, not being protected. And so that's why it's critically important to minimize the number of your human contacts. And, and especially to minimize the number of human contacts in indoor settings uh, where people are breathing and where air circulation is not great. So the simple behaviors, which we all know, and I won't belabor this because everybody is, has, been, has been told this, of trying to stay distant from people, trying to do outdoors as much as possible, and wearing masks is, is critically important. Um, if we did that, if everybody in the United States did that, and, and the hand hygiene part, by the way, is that if you get it on your hands, you can't get it from your hands. So that's why the whole glove thing doesn't make much sense. But if you wear it on, if you get it on your hands and then touch your eyes or your nose or your mouth, then you can put it into your body. So if you wash your hands before you touch your face, you can't spread it from any kind of, any kind of physical contact. And the virus, by the way, doesn't live very long on most environmental surfaces so that although it said keep your surfaces clean, that's not a common way to spread. It's mostly spread through the air. The astonishing thing is that people really socially distance and, 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 and obey these rules and wore the mask, the virus would disappear. I mean, it, it could only live in, and spread in humans. The animals, by the way, are not very good vectors. Animals can get it, but they don't spread it very easily. Children, it turns out, can get it and they don't spread it very easily. It's mostly adults. And if everybody just followed these simple rules, the virus would go away. It would disappear. So that everything that we're seeing uh, in this, this, this terrible, dismal picture that I have, um, I have uh, described to you is because of human behavior and bad human behavior. Um, there's one thing that hasn't received as much, um, I think, publicity as, as maybe should, is when they looked at the Chinese data, um, and the Chinese did a really remarkable job of actually collecting data, and, and most of the good publications that we're seeing are out of China about the biology of, of COVID. Um, is that about a third of the people in Hubei province wear glasses, but only 6% of the people hospitalized for severe COVID wore, wore, wore glasses. This means that uh, you can spread it and catch it in your eyes, and glasses convey some sense of protection. Now, in a medical facility, we wear uh, shields or we wear goggles, so that's even better, but probably just eyeglasses. So I tell everybody, if you're outside and you don't wear glasses, normally wear sunglasses because it probably does convey some degree of protection. And that's something that I think is important that hasn't, I think, received enough, enough, enough attention. So now let's get to the, to the vaccines, which is the main thing that people wanted me to talk about. And I think that uh, I want to spend uh, you know, the next 10 minutes or so really, really talking about vaccines and what they mean. So this is your virus that causes COVID. It's, it's SARS-CoV-2. It's a coronavirus. It's, it's got a piece of RNA in the middle. Um, uh, the way cells work is your DNA is the instruction set. The way the DNA makes your cell do something is it makes RNA and the RNA makes proteins. And the proteins are the, are, are the business end of the biological process. Um, SARS has RNA in it. So if it gets into your body, that RNA teaches your, your cells to do things because it makes proteins. 
And some of those proteins are very, very destructive to the, to the cells that are in it. And, uh, and that's where you get the organ damage from it. The, 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 the RNA is surrounded uh, by a capsule uh, and that capsule um, has, a, uh, has these little spikes. I hope you can see my arrow here. These are little protein spikes and we call that the spike protein. Uh, and that's really the thing that we're aiming at most with the vaccines. Although there's also proteins between the spikes and it's called nucleocapsids. Um, and, that, and, and the nucleocapsids um, are, uh, are also proteins that can be attacked. And the way your body attacks these things is your body can make antibodies which um, are structures that your body make, complex proteins that your body makes that attach onto the target. And when that happens, other white cells can eat the virus and kill it. So, and, and sometimes the antibodies by themselves can destroy the virus. Uh, and, and, and so this is, this is the, the attack module that, that our bodies have. How do we get these antibodies? Well, if you get infected with and survive, uh, your body will make antibodies, and that's how your body heals yourself from the virus, by making these antibodies. And these antibodies do seem to last after you've gotten an infection. This is a question that I get a lot. Is it better to get a mild infection and get antibodies or, or, or the vaccines? You know, wouldn't it be better if everybody just got a mild infection and then they developed antibodies? And the answer is unequivocally no, because this RNA is still in your cells. And even though you have antibodies and you may not get the manifestation, of the disease uh, that's overt, uh, that RNA can still affect the cells and can still do bad things to your cells. And we don't know what those bad things are. And that's why I emphasize that part of the process. Um, uh, and beside that, um, the antibody levels that you make can be low enough that they actually don't protect you very much. They may protect you from getting sick, but they might not protect you from getting an infection again, which you're able to spread and keep it going, keep it going in the community. So that that is, a, uh, that, that, is, that is also no good. So this idea of herd immunity by natural infection the Swedes tried it. It was a disaster in Sweden, um, and uh, and and beside that, you know, uh, you know, we will be dealing with more hundreds of thousands of deaths trying to achieve the herd immunity that we're not going to treat, achieve anyway. So it made no sense whatsoever to to take that tack. Um, there are two better ways of getting the antibodies. One, which uh, has not received, uh, it's received a little publicity, but still, I'm I'm, I'm impressed that a lot of people don't know about it. Is two companies have made our antibodies outside of, of the human body that can be administered to somebody who's infected with, with, uh, with SARS-CoV-2. And, and these antibodies can come and attack and, and prevent, we think, severe, severe infection. Uh, it's Eli Lilly and, uh, and Regeneron are the two companies that have made it. Uh, they have very limited supply. Our hospitals have it, and our hospitals are trying to figure out the best way to use it. And I'll have more comments on that uh, as we, as we, as, as we end, end, end the lecture. But of course, the very best way to do this is to vaccinate and, uh, and to do something to your body that makes your body not get sick with, with, with COVID, but also make the antibodies that can prevent you from getting sick with COVID. And of course, I'm showing a picture of a needle here. And most, right now, most of the vaccines are being developed have to be administered by a needle shot, but not all of them. Some can be given intranasally. And there's even one and maybe two uh, that can be given by a skin patch. So that, uh, so, and, and, and a few that are being developed orally where you can actually take it by mouth. And so we'll talk about those as we run through that list um, uh, you know, shortly. There are right now um, in the various phases of development, 78 uh, vaccines in human trials. There are more than hundred that are being developed there in other kinds of, uh, it was preclinical, it's in, really in animals, but in, in human trials, there, 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 there are 78. There are 41 that are in phase one, and that means they're being tested just to see that they're safe. Uh, we're not seeing very much toxicity from any of them, I've got to tell you. So, the, so that, you know, we were afraid of that, you know, just cautious like all doctors are causing harm with, uh, with our therapies. We're not seeing very much of that. 17 are in phase two, which means they're being tested to see if they raise antibodies. And phase three is the definitive test, um, and there are 13 in large scale trials where patients are being randomized, volunteers, not patients, volunteers are being randomized to get the vaccine or to get a placebo and to see what the, what the incidence of, of, of infection is in those individuals. Um, and there are a few that have approval in limited use, and we'll talk about those as we go through them. So one major type of vaccine, and the one that's hit, hit, hit the screen fastest, are the vaccines that deliver one or more of coronavirus genes into our cells so our cells can start to produce proteins 
like particularly the spike protein so that we, our own bodies can actually make antibodies to the spike protein. Uh, let me show you the way this worked. The way DNA vaccines work, I actually made an animation or I, got, I found an animation for you. The way, the way that the DNA vaccines work is the, the DNA gets put in, the DNA then makes RNA and the RNA makes the cell make those proteins. So now your own cells are making proteins that your own immune system can react to and make antibodies. RNA vaccines don't go through the DNA step. They actually put RNA directly in and that RNA instructs the cell again to make spike proteins and the spike proteins come out and your body develops antibodies to it. The, the two, uh, oops. Oops, 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 I won't do that. The two vaccines that you've heard about so far are both RNA vaccines. They're called messenger RNA vaccines. One of them is by Pfizer um, together with other partners um, in this regard. And this has been approved for emergency use in England. A friend of mine just got her vaccine today uh, in, in, the, in the UK um, uh, uh, by Pfizer. It's going to a, an advisory board of the, of, uh, that will reach the FDA uh, in, in the next few days. And uh, we think by December 15th, uh, it'll be officially released what's called an emergency use. It's not a full approval, but it's an emergency use. Uh, and, and the first shipment is gonna be happening just in about a week or so. And the other is Moderna. Uh, this was in conjunction with the, uh, the National Institute of Health. Uh, Pfizer did it on its own. It had enough money to do it on its own in conjunction with partners but Moderna uh, did it in conjunction with uh, Project Warp Speed. And these are both uh, RNA vaccines uh, that uh, have, uh, have reached the point that they've gone through phase three trials. People say to me all the time, well, Larry, would you be the first person to get the vaccine? I said, probably I would have volunteered for the trials, but I wasn't asked to participate in the trials, but tens of thousands of people have already gotten these vaccines. So when this comes out in the next few weeks, you're not gonna be, you're not gonna say, hey, I wanna be the first. You're nowhere near the first. Tens of thousands of people have gotten this already and they've proven to be effective, actually remarkably effective, like 95% effective and also remarkably safe. Um, you know, sure, something could pop up in six months or so that we don't expect. And when we, we, we treat millions of people, probably uh, or some rare cases, but the likelihood of any kind of severe toxicity is extremely small uh, because so many people have participated in these trials, tens of thousands of people. The issue is not that. The issue is that the, the, the companies will have enough, will have about 40 million uh, doses to give out. And 40 million doses uh, would be, um, uh, you have to give two, two shots per person to get, to get good antibodies about three weeks apart. So 40 million doses is 20 million Americans being able to be treated. And to put this, there are 320 million Americans there are 21 million healthcare workers, which would be one of the first groups that would have to be uh, you know, vaccinated so they could take care of people with COVID. There are another 87 million essential workers, the people that actually have to go out of the house every day to keep the machinery of the United States going. There's about 100 million uh, people at high risk because of those conditions like obesity and diabetes that, and heart disease that I mentioned earlier. And there are 53 million people that, that are in the older age group, over 65, um, uh, that are at high risk, uh, as you saw in the previous curves. So there's a whole lot of people who are not gonna be able to get the first tranche of uh, vaccines as they come through. So there's gonna to have to be some prioritization. And right now, the debate is, should it be healthcare workers who are taking care of COVID patients predominantly, or should it be people in long-term care facilities? Because people in long-term care facilities are in crowded conditions, are elderly for the most part, have a lot of comorbidities, um, uh, and therefore are at extremely high risk of getting severe COVID. Now, I want to emphasize, when I talk about severe COVID, most cases are mild or moderate, all right? As I say, we're not sure what happens long-term, but in the short term, they're mild or you know, moderate. Though moderate can still make you feel pretty crummy. But, but getting hospitalized is what we're talking about and getting, having to put, be put in an ICU and on a breathing machine, and a high percentage of those people go on to die of the disease. There's also something called cytokine storm when you have severe COVID, where your body's immune system goes haywire and is overactive. And, uh, and starts to uh, destroy your normal organs. And that's what I mean by severe COVID, and that's the thing that we're trying to avoid. Um, so as you see, you know, even though these vaccines are extremely exciting, uh, they're not going to make the, uh, the big impact until there's more that's gonna come out in, in, in January, in February, in March. And probably the big impact is not going to be, I I've been saying March and April, it may be more like April and May when there will be enough to come out. And the reason I'm saying that is because 
there are plenty of other companies that are working on this. And I don't want people to walk away thinking there's only going to be two, two vaccines. Um, these are vaccines that are in phase, th phase two studies. Some of them are, are, are interesting. This one, for example, is a skin patch. This one um, is Tesla um, company is going to have micro factories all over the world but to make this one and it requires minimal refrigeration. The, one of the problems with the uh, other RNA vaccines that you heard about, um, particularly the Pfizer one has to be really deep frozen, minus 70. Um, uh, the, uh, a regular, uh, for the Moderna one, a regular freezer will work, but still transporting these things to that temperature and, for, and protecting it and keeping it whole until it actually goes in the patient could be a problem. Having minimal refrigeration could be a huge advance. And many others are being developed in this way. The, this company developed one that can be given not by injection, but by a machine that kind of pushes it through the skin. This company seems to be having some difficulties in this regard now, although the clinical trials are also are starting again, so we'll keep our eyes on that one. Uh, many others are being developed really all over the world um, uh, you know, uh, that in this regard. This one attacks that nucleocapsid I mentioned, not just the spike protein. This one is a pill. This one gives another a gene that makes the cells make interleukin-12, which stimulates the immune system by itself because you want to stimulate the immune system. Um, and so those are the RNA ones. Another class of vaccines are vaccines that are actually viruses, usually adenoviruses, which are another common cause of colds that you don't get very sick from. But they're adenoviruses that have some of the genetic material of coronaviruses in them so that when they enter into the cells, um, they make your, your cells can make more of those proteins that your body can make antibodies against. Um, there are a bunch of them that are coming through. And interestingly enough, some of the ones that got approved um, already in places like China and in Russia are of this type. Uh, these are, have not been thoroughly tested. They say they're in phase three studies now, but they've also been approved right now for use. So they're going into people before they've been fully tested. The AstraZeneca one that came out of Oxford University, we've had a lot of interest in, but the clinical trial results were very strange because by accident, some patients got a half dose uh, before, and then three weeks later got the full dose. Whoops, moving too fast here. And the ones who got the half dose first, then the full dose seemed to develop more antibodies and have more protection than the ones who got both full doses. So this is kind of going back to the drawing board. This one is going back to the drawing board and they, they're still doing studies Although, although there is, there is movement afoot to actually get this one also approved, um, at, at least in the modified dose scheme. And uh, Johnson Johnson also has one that's coming down the pike rapidly. And there are many, many in phase one, uh, some of them that are oral, some of them are given by nasal spray, some of them that attack both the spike protein and nucleocapsid. And these are all that are going into humans, seeing if they develop antibodies and will go through phase two and eventually phase three. Another class of viruses actually um, don't contain anything but, but, um, but the proteins. And so they know genetic material. They put the proteins into your body and your body could then make uh, antibodies against them. Uh, that uh, there are several that are actually in, in far advanced phase three trial. I find this one fascinating because this one is actually using plants to make those proteins to make the vaccine. This shows a factory and what these plants are making, these are tobacco plants. This is a, a tobacco company that decided to diversify and not just make tobacco for smoking, but actually genetically engineer tobacco plants so they can make medicinals like vaccines. This is uh, making vaccines for Ebola. And, um, uh, and, and the same technology can be used where these plants can be ground up and the proteins come out of it and that could be used to actually vaccinate people so people will develop antibodies to this. Um, uh, many other companies are in this, are, 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 are in this space. Again, the Russians, this is in phase two, and yet it's still approved for use. Uh, no comment about that, but it's obviously not, not something that's been definitively tested. Um, uh, and pay attention also, by the way, those of you who are interested in, in the business aspects of this, uh, there are companies that don't make vaccines, but make what's called adju ad 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 adjuvants uh, or adjunctive drugs that actually help the body's immune system react to the vaccines and make higher levels of the antibodies. Uh, there are several, uh, and this company uh, is, is involved with several of them, but there, there are others as well. Uh, this particular vaccine is just in phase one, but we're paying a lot of attention to it because it could be kept at room temperature, which for worldwide use could be a huge boon. This one is also using a, um, uh, a tobacco plant. Uh, it's the other one that's using a tobacco plant, as I just showed you. Um, and many others are being developed. Uh, this one in Cuba is going to play by nasal spray and so on. The, the reason why I'm going through all this is to say that it's not just these two, two vaccines. We've got many vaccines that are coming down the pike. 
Now, the, the last class of vaccines are ones that are actually looking, are, are they're actually weakened coronaviruses or bonaviruses that have actually been killed. This is the classical way to make a vaccine. And this is the way the whole vaccine thing started in the middle of the 19th century with Louis Pasteur. Um, it was an accident. Uh, you know, it's kind of interesting in this regard. It was just a pure accident is that um, he was supposed that, that uh, Louis Pasteur's technician was supposed to put um, cholera, chicken cholera into chickens to see why the chickens got sick. And he forgot to do so for a month um, while Louis Pasteur was on vacation. Louis Pasteur came back, was angry at him. So they took that, um, that, that those, uh, those organisms, those germs and put them into the chickens trying to give them illness. But they had been attenuated. Many of the, many of the organisms had died over that month in culture. So it was an attenuated virus, a, a, a weakened virus. And uh, it was not actually a virus, but a weakened, a weakened germ. And so the chickens didn't get sick. So Louis Pasteur was very angry and he really wanted the chickens to get sick so he could study the disease. So then he inoculated them with full dose of, of, the, of the organism and none of them got sick. And that's how he discovered that a weak form of, of, uh, of exposure uh, could actually help the chicken develop immunity so they don't get sick. And that's, that's really what started everything that we're talking about by that basically act of serendipity and genius moving forward in, in the second half of the, of the 19th century. The way this one works, uh, is that you put the weakened virus in to your body, your cells pick it up, and of course it's a virus. It divides, it makes more viruses, makes more protein, and then because it's a, it's a bad virus, it's, a, it's not an efficient virus, the virus gets killed by the body or the virus dies spontaneously, and you're left with all those proteins that are splitting through your body, which can make very high levels of antibodies, and it's the classical way to get the highest levels of antibodies. Um, many uh, of these are being developed, are, are in phase three. Again, although they're in phase three, they're improved for limited use in the Emirates, for example. This one is approved, it, it's still not done with phase three, but it's approved for limited use in China. And apparently more than a million people have gotten in this one in China already. The military, for example, and, and government officials, and there are others in development as well. Those of us in the field think you've got to wait for the end of the phase three trial before you, um, before you actually disseminate the public, but obviously there are countries that are um, uh, that think that's not necessary. Um, there are others uh, of these that are in phase two, uh, both in China and in Russia. And uh, there's others in phase one. This is the one that I'm involved with, full disclosure. I'm, I'm, I'm a, uh, an advisor to this company because they were developing, I was working with them to develop a cancer vaccine. Um, and the, what enabled them to move nimbly into this area is that they make a virus that's totally synthetic they manufacture a synthetic virus. They make a DNA, the RNA makes an RNA, and the RNA then is, is, is the business end of the virus. Because you're making the virus that is totally synthetic, you've got total control over it, so you know that people aren't gonna get sick from it, you know it's gonna be particularly active. And this is not right now in phase one trial. So, so and the advantage of this approach, by the way, is if there are mutations of the virus and there are different viruses, you're dealing with, with, with COVID-19, if there's a COVID-20 or a COVID-21, that this technology could be rapidly adapted to be able to make new vaccines to new, to new things that are coming along. And the RNA vaccines like Pfizer and Moderna have come out, we can do this as well. Okay, so, so here's the problem. And this is what I wanna finish, finish up with. Um, the problem is that um, we're not gonna have a lot of those therapeutic antibodies that I mentioned uh, from Regeneron and from Eli Lilly. And we're not gonna have a lot of vaccines for many, many months. So how are we gonna prioritize their use? And obviously people are talking a lot about uh, healthcare workers that are on the front lines and are exposed to these people, essential workers, uh, you know, firemen and policemen and essential workers, people that keep the machinery of our, of our, of our culture going, uh, older people and people with, with, with illnesses like obesity and, and like heart disease. So how are we gonna spread this out? Right now, the, the predominant discussion is frontline healthcare workers, not all healthcare workers, there are 21 million of us, we're not gonna be, there's only, there's only enough for 20 million total. So it's gonna be the people that are in the front lines, they're working in the emergency rooms and intensive care units and COVID wards. And, and old people, particularly in long-term care facilities are gonna be the first, the first group that are going to get it. But, and, 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 but these people are at high risk as well. So we know that we're going to give some preference to older people and people that are high risk because they have comor we call comorbid conditions, which means other things that predispose like diabetes and high blood pressure and obesity. But the fact is that we have a lot of people that don't have obesity and hypertension and diabetes and are young, but, but are, are at risk because they're exposed to the public. And can we tell in this population who is at sufficient risk 
that they should join in, uh, in, in, in moving up the line and be able to get uh, the vaccines uh, preferentially uh, early so they don't get sick so they can continue to keep our, our civilization going. So quick change of subject. There is a phenomenon called clonal hematopoiesis, all right? And what that is, is, is your white cells are made in your bone marrow. And, and your white cells are made because there's something called hematopoietic stem cell, which is kind of the granddaddy of all your white cells. This can develop mutations and you could have mutant DNA changed white cells coming out of your marrow. And, <laughs> and sometimes these um, mutant white cells, excuse me, clonally expand, which means that they increase in numbers. Um, does this happen commonly? The answer is it happens very commonly. Um, these somatically mutated cells, the DNA altered white blood cells can be found in the peripheral blood. And when they're in the peripheral blood, um, they, they can cause illnesses and they're associated with increased hardening of the arteries, increased blood clotting issues, heart failure, and also uh, blood cancers like, like leukemia. And this is being very, very actively studied. Um, my own group with my colleagues um, have found very recently that we find these mutated white blood cells commonly infiltrating breast cancers. So we think that it's implicated in breast cancer, exactly what it's doing, we don't know yet, but it's being very, very actively studied uh, at the present time uh, to try to figure out what those white cells are doing in this disease. So it may relate to other cancers beside uh, the blood cancers in this setting. Now, as I said, it's not that uncommon. We see it's clonal hematopoiesis, you know, um, uh, is associated with, with blood types of cancers like leukemias, associated with heart disease. And the risk factors for having this problem are age, 20% of people over 80 will have clonal hematopoiesis, um, smoking, which predisposes to heart disease, diabetes, inflammation, and one of the commonest causes of inflammation is obesity. Um, and, and a few other specialized things related to uh, the hematological system. Why is this so fascinating? What are the risk factors for severe COVID, right? Being in the hospital, having to be intubated and perhaps dying. It's age, it's heart disease, it's diabetes, and it's an inflammatory state like obesity. So many of us as early as March said, maybe this clonal hematopoiesis that we're studying because of its relationship to cancer may have something to do with getting severe COVID. And the bottom line is the answer is yes, this, this, is, this has been presented at an international meeting and, is, and the papers are right now um, uh, in the final stages of being reviewed for major journals. This is one that I was involved in. There's another one coming from another extremely large uh, group uh, in Boston. I won't say more than that, but the papers can, are, are actually posted on an internet site where, where papers in consideration are, 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 are there. And it turns out it's true is that if you have COVID, these are, these are over 400 patients who had COVID at Memorial, and you have clonal hematopoiesis, you've got a 30% chance you're gonna end up in the hospital and very, very sick. If you have COVID and you don't have clonal hematopoiesis, it's only a 17% chance. Now, of course, many of those are people that have other comorbid conditions that have obesity, and, uh, and I taking my slides, I have a mind of their own. It, uh, you know, obesity and heart disease and other, other kinds of situations. But clonal hematopoiesis is an independent risk factor of those other factors and increases your chances. So that perhaps by measuring clonal hematopoiesis, which is a simple blood test, we can pick individuals who don't otherwise fall into high-risk groups, uh, who are at high risk and may not know they're at high risk and preferentially treat those either with the therapeutic antibodies if they get infected or with vaccines um, early on so that they don't get infected. And so this is an active area of investigation that we're pursuing at the present time. So I've spent with you um, a little bit over half an hour, something in the range of about 40 minutes. Uh, and this is just in summary. Um, it's really bad, but there's real hope. Uh, the hope is in therapy uh, with the monoclonal antibodies and in prevention with the vaccines. And also if we can convince people to behave uh, and, and we're trying really hard and everybody's listening to this, please behave yourself and please convince other people to behave. Um, one of the most common places where it's transmitted is restaurants because you can't have a mask on when you're eating. And, uh, and just, just the this, just this simple understanding of the biology of how, of how the virus uh, spreads, uh, it's respiratory, it spreads from person to person through things that are coming out of your mouth and your nose. And uh, that's important. Be aware of the risks of factors, particularly age and, and, and the other risk factors. 
And there's additional hope in this new idea here that I've talked talk about in terms of identifying people who are uh, at, at exceptionally high risk, who may not fall into, into, into our currently understood risk groups. So those people can, be, um, uh, can undergo preventive strategies or early thera therapeutic intervention if they do get to COVID. So thank you all very much. And I hope to spend the rest of the time that we have together answering all your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Norton. Um, we're very privileged to have you once again in front of our community and our friends. And we appreciate your taking the time to share your insights about what's happening with COVID on the front lines. Um, I know there are many, many questions out there, some with answers, some without. And for those who are listening, you can submit any questions you have um, through the chat and through the Q&A function on the bottom of your screen. And then I'm happy to share those with Dr. Norton. Um, but let me get us started by saying that um, I've seen you quoted, Dr. Norton, as saying that decisions make themselves with sufficient information. Yet one of the challenges of decision making around COVID is that the information has not always been sufficient. Um, we're learning as we go, learning rapidly, certainly, but tackling something new and of immense proportion and impact. Um, that said, the vaccines seem to have been uh, approved at a warp speed, even through the clinical trial phase. And I was wondering if you could speak um, a little bit as to whether this was a remarkable timeline, given that vaccines in the past have often taken mm. 10 to 15 years to develop. Yeah, well, there's uh, commenting on both those things. Yeah, yeah, well, that's one of the greatest tragedies that we have now is mixed messaging. All right. Um, uh, the biology is very straightforward. And, uh, and, and yet there's been a lot of confusing messaging out there. And that's something that really, has really you know, impeded progress to, to, to an enormous degree. Uh, you know, mask wearing is not, a, not an issue of personal freedom, you know, um, uh, you know, it's an issue of health. It's public health, you know, uh, you know, requirement, you know, I mean, do you stop at stop signs? Do you stop at red lights? I mean, that's a public health thing and that's a law, you know, wearing a mask is the same thing It's to protect you and protect other people. So we've had very, we've, we, we haven't had clean messaging on that. And I think that's really been a big problem. You're totally right. There's no questioning. There's no question about it. I'm getting things that are popping up here that I want to try to get rid of. There's no question about it. Is that the um, uh, is that the um, uh, the vaccines have got developed at an enormously rapid rapid pace, uh, eight months, which normally takes many years. But the reason basically is it, it's it, and it's all economics. Basically, is that is that um, uh, governments, uh, the American government, you know, and uh, UK and uh, Canada and and governments around the world have put have put money behind it by basically guaranteeing that they're going to purchase. The vaccines um, uh, and uh, when when they're available, and that has actually you know de-risked uh, the, the situation for the various companies that are moving forward. The, the reason that it takes a long time to develop vaccines is that you don't make a whole lot of money with vaccines. I mean, vaccines are not a very profitable area for the pharmaceutical industry, and so uh, and so the lack of the profitability is what really has driven uh, you know the fact that we do it. But we have technically have the capabilities of doing it quickly, and I've mentioned several different technologies there that now can be used to be able to develop, develop it quickly. Uh, the Moderna one used Operation Warp Speed, the Pfizer one did not use Operation Warp Speed, so um, uh, they used their own resources in that regard. Uh, but they were, both those companies were very well prepared with the technology to move forward. And I, I think that one of the most important things, good things that can come out of this, if anything good can come out of this, um, is that um, we will have greased the wheels being able to make vaccines faster, because this is not gonna be the last pandemic that we're gonna see. Um, uh, with global with global travel um, and uh, and also increasing world population, uh, we are going to see more vaccines, uh, you know, uh, more viruses that are going to mutate and going to affect people. So we've got to be ready for them, so that uh, the, the public health movers uh, are important. I mean, people say with SARS, why 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 didn't SARS cause a pandemic? And it's very simple: is you, with SARS, the first one of these coronaviruses that that caused epidemics, um, tr truly pandemic. You, you had to be sick to be able to actually spread the virus. Most of the virus, most of the cases of COVID now are coming from people that they're catching it from people who are asymptomatic. From uh, for two to three days before you get your fever, you can be you can spread the virus. I didn't talk too much about that. The time limitations, uh, which is with SARS, if you take somebody's temperature and it's elevated, you keep them out of your building. But somebody who seems perfectly healthy could be very infectious now, and that's the reason why it spread so rapidly. And so um, I think something good can come out of this in terms of our ability to develop vaccines quickly. 
Okay, very good. Um, I don't know if you saw the New York Post today, but there was a large blurb on the front page titled First Refusers. And the article was talking about the first responders within the ranks of the fire department, um, as well as the MTA who say they will refuse the vaccine. And I was wondering if you could share any thoughts you might have on it, anti yeah, it's, it, it's just misinformation. All right. I mean, a lot I'm saying I don't want to be the first wave of people getting the vaccine. Well, they're not. You know, you know, tens of thousands of people have received the vaccine before them and have been followed carefully for, for the last last several months. So um, so they're not going to be the first ones to get it. Why there is so much fear of vaccines, it, it's, it's totally irrational. Uh, it does not make any scientific sense uh, that, that people would have so many so, so, so much fear. Um, could there be some minor long term consequences of vaccination? conceivably, but really very hard to conceive, because basically it's just teaching your immune system to respond to a foreign invader. Um, uh, but on the other hand, COVID is a, is a, is a lethal disease now, all right? Uh, I mean, and, and so, you know, you, I mean, you're facing, you're facing a, a, a lethal problem, you know? Um, I, I knew somebody once who, who didn't wear a seatbelt in the car because she said that, um, you know, if I get into an accident, I wouldn't be out of the car quickly, all right? Um, uh, and therefore she didn't wear a seatbelt. So the theoretical of getting out of the car quickly as opposed to, and she was in a fender bender, very minor accident without a seatbelt, and she did not die, thank you, um, God. She did not die, but she, um, uh, she, her face was so smashed up, she needed many operations and she never regained the sight in one eye because she didn't wear a seatbelt because she was afraid she wouldn't get out of the car quickly if she had an accident. And so people who are refusing the vaccine, you know, are not wearing seatbelts because we're all driving and we're all subject to getting COVID. So it's just a matter of public education and of, of, of rational explanation. And, and, and it goes back to your first point. I think the public messaging has not been clear on this. And it's something that we're all trying extremely hard to, uh, to convey the accurate, accurate messages in this regard so that people don't have irrational fears. They have rational fears. You should be rationally afraid of COVID. Uh, they don't have irrational fears. They, they have rational fears, not irrational fears, and they get vaccinated. And also, by the way, it's also um, for public health reasons. You know, if you get COVID, all right, so maybe you're not going to get very sick, uh, but you're going to spread it to other people, all right? And you spread it to people that you love. And they're going to spread it to other people, including people that you love. And, um, uh, and so it's a, uh, you know, there's a strong public health altruistic motivation as well as protecting yourself. Several people are asking if you had to choose one of the vaccines that you discussed, which yeah. one would you recommend? Um, does it vary by age of the individual who's mm -hmm. taking it? Um, mm -hmm. uh, no. you, I, I, I would take the first one that was available to me because it doesn't matter how you get antibodies. It doesn't matter as long as you get antibodies, all right? The advantages of some over the other are gonna be largely in terms of uh, distribution. If you don't have to refrigerate it or if you don't have to freeze it, um, uh, you know, uh, you know, ease of administration in terms of intranasal instead of injection. Th those are the ones that are going to actually play out long term in terms of administration. But any vaccine that's gone through phase three testing, phase three testing, I would not take a vaccine that has not gone through phase three testing. So if I were in Moscow and they offered me a vaccine that had not gone through phase three testing, I would refuse that one. But the vaccines like the Moderna and the Pfizer that have gone through phase three testing and are going to be scrutinized by a very sophisticated group of experts in, in the FDA. Uh, that can't be duplicated by any individual state, frankly, um, uh, in the same way, that's deemed to be safe and effective, you know, as, as soon as that's available to me, I would absolutely take it. I don't care which one. Hello? By now, um, many of us have had friends who have had COVID and have antibodies, um, supposedly. Right. And I was just wondering if you could speak to whether those who've had COVID are safe. Is there a risk of reinfection? And um, what do we know at this point about the duration of the antibodies? Um, it's too soon to know the total duration. It looks like it doesn't go away quickly. It looks like it lasts for at least months, but we don't know if it lasts for years. I mean, there are some vaccines. Uh, you know, uh, you know that you know one exposure protects you for life. There are other vaccines like the flu vaccine that you got to take every year. So we don't know yet in that particular regard. So we're going to have to work out ways of monitoring that by by periodic blood testing. And that's where the what they call the post marketing surveys are going to tell us. We'll get that information as the, as you know as the science proceeds. Um, um, people vary enormously in terms of the amount of antibodies they make after they have an infection. And um, right now it looks like reinfection is rare, but that means re-illness is rare. In other words, if you've had COVID, you've been sick with it, you know, it's not very likely. There are a few uh, people that have gotten sick again, all right? 
but it's not very likely to get sick. But we don't know how many people can get infected again, not have any symptoms, and be able to spread it to other people. So, you know, I know people that have said, I'm, I'm, inviting, I'm inviting a couple over to my house and it's perfectly safe. We don't have to wear masks because they had COVID. And that's wrong because they could be reinfected with COVID and they can infect you even though they may not get sick with COVID themselves. The other related question that I ask, so that's, that's something else that people really have to know. The other related question is, if I've had COVID, do I have to get vaccinated? And the answer is absolutely yes. Is that in fact, you actually may be in a better situation because of prior exposure, the vaccine may even be better in terms of making antibodies because getting high levels of antibodies that last um, could be extremely, extremely effective in this regard. With coronaviruses, think of the common cold. There are a third of them are caused by coronaviruses and you can get a cold several times a year, even though you've had previous colds that year. So that um, uh, it's absolutely imperative that we vaccinate the entire population, including people. As a matter of fact, about 10% of the people who went into the clinical trials that I mentioned, the phase three clinical trials, had already had COVID antibodies when they got, when they got vaccinated for COVID and the ones who got the vaccine still got additional incremental protection. Um, similar to what you're saying about the antibodies and being able to transmit, I wanted to ask you in relation to the vaccines, do the vaccines prevent you from getting infected or simply from getting sick? And I ask that in the vein of um, wondering, once you've taken a vaccine, if you are infected um, or if you know, you've been infected, can you then transmit to someone else based on the vaccine you receive? Uh, we really don't have the definitive answer to that question. That's going to, that, because we haven't vaccinated large enough numbers of people yet that, you know, we're going to have to vaccinate millions of people to get the answer to that infection, to that question, because that's, that's got to be answered by public health epidemiology. You know, when we start to get a significant percentage of the population vaccinated, if we see COVID going away and disappearing, we're going to know that it's actually preventing, preventing the spread by that, by that means. Um, uh, but the likelihood from what I'm seeing is that unlike the natural infection that could raise low levels of antibodies, the levels of antibodies that you get from the vaccines are high enough that they probably could prevent colonization. In other words, you know, um, uh, you know, carrying the vaccine uh, in your body even though you get sick from it. So, so vaccination is 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 critical. Um, the other thing that's critical is testing, and I didn't mention that at all. Is there, are any of your questions there about testing, or or are people less interested in that? Um, I don't have so many about testing, but please speak to that. I, you know, people are. I, I just want to. I want to say. You, you, we so. we saw a ton of people. You know, you know, you know, travel to be with their families for Thanksgiving, and they say it was fine because I got a, I got a COVID test and I was negative, so it's okay for me to travel. First of all, um, you know, if you're exposed to COVID, it takes you several days before you develop enough virus in you to test positive on the best test, which is PCR. The the, the bad tests, which are the what the rapid tests, which are incredibly inaccurate. Um, uh, it's even worse than that, all right? But even with the best test of PCR, so you could be actually sick with COVID, you know, for several days and test negative. And I know people that have actually had frank classical COVID who never tested positive, even though they went through their whole illness with the COVID. Secondly is, you know, you get the test and you're negative. Let's imagine you really are not carrying the virus and you go to an airport and you get on an airplane, you go into taxi and you go to some of these homes, you could easily be exposed during that period of time as well. So that there's a lot of co false confidence in the testing. The testing is really important in, in large groups of people like schools and companies where you're trying to nip super spreader events you know, quickly. And so, and so the, 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 vac the, the testing is, is an incredibly important public health use, which is private health too, because if the public, if the public is protected, then the private will be protected. Uh, the, you know, the individual will be protected, so it still is important. But to protect the individual saying, I got a COVID test, so it's okay for so me to be bound my friends without a mask because I got COVID testing, that makes no medical sense whatsoever. And so a lot of people, a lot of people are, 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 are actually putting themselves and other people in jeopardy because of false confidence in the testing. Right. So um, we have some practical questions that have come in. Um, somebody says, my grandson who's 19 had COVID in March. His only symptom was no smell. Now he has terrible taste, rotten eggs and tomatoes. Will this go away? Is there something that can be done to help him like acupuncture or Chinese herbs, for example? Uh, so far, nothing has helped. And, uh, and we don't know how long those symptoms will last. That's okay. all I can tell you. Because yeah. basically, Many, many, many people have those kinds of problems, uh, you know, long term, uh, and uh, and and so far we've not found any because basically it's, it's the the RNA from the virus has gotten into the cells that are responsible for those sensations and have fundamentally permanently changed those cells. We, it's possible that that 
new cells will grow and that the old cells that are infected will eventually die off and that will, that will restore those functions, but we don't know yet. And we've seen people with headaches continuously for months and months and months ago, don't go away, but similarly, it's, it's um, the virus has affected the lining of the brain and had that effect. So that's why it's so critically important not to get infected and to do everything possible to prevent other people from getting infected. Um, somebody has asked, when, in your opinion, will we get back to normal, meaning being able to go to a restaurant, a Broadway show, a concert, a wedding, et cetera? Um, you know, you know any, any estimate is, you know, first of all, it's, it's not going to be ever totally normal because we've learned a lot here that I think is these lessons are going to be maintained, you know, moving forward. So it's going to be different, you know, moving forward, I think, I think moving forward. But things like restaurants without masks and theater and stuff like that, um, some people are saying um, by the summer. Other hi, hi there, hello. Some people, some people are saying by the summer, and some people are saying by the fall. Uh, it's not going to be by the spring because widespread vaccination isn't going to really be happening until the spring, probably um, you know April, May into June. Um, so I think I think we're still going to have to be extremely careful, you know, going into the summer. Maybe by the end of the summer, that that uh, and a lot depends upon how people behave in terms of the public health recommendations and social, social distancing and masking. Because if, if indeed we can make the, um, the, the, the prevalence in the population low enough, then we can, start to, um, we can start to have that kind of life. But you know, the way things are looking now, it, it's either late summer or, or, or the fall. And we've had several questions come in about day-to-day -day life right now. Um, is it safe to get a sandwich or pizza for takeout? Is it necessary to wipe off groceries? Is it safe to travel? Could you speak to any all right, of those? All right. Well, let's, let's take them one at a time. Um, uh, I, look, you got to eat. Um, so, I mean, you know, you got to get groceries one way or the other, you know, in that, in that kind of regard too. Yeah, takeout looks like it's safe. I mean, I mean again, you know, you, you follow the same kind of safety precautions that we were talking about, social distancing, mask wearing, wash your hands. Um, washing down like groceries and stuff like that is um, most, most of the people, you know, who are in the public health space are not doing that because the surfaces are not a very good way to transmit the virus. And again, too, you, just by touching it, you're not going to get it. You know, you got to put it into your eyes, your nose, your mouth. And if you wash your hands before you eat, uh, which you should be doing, you know, if, if, you, if you're a good Jew, um, if you're careful about personal hygiene in that regard, you're not going to expose it to your eyes, your nose, and your mouth, and therefore you're not going to be able to get it that, that, that particular way. So environmental services is not the hu huge risk. The reason why travel is a problem is because um, of what I said uh, you know, earlier. It's strictly a phenomenon of the number of people that you're going to be in contact with. Um, uh, and you, know, you think about it on an airplane, you're all breathing the same air. Um, for hours, perhaps, you know, in, and, and, it's a, and it's a large number of people. The, the odds that everybody on that airplane, everybody is COVID negative is extremely small. I showed you those curves. So the odds are very high, you know, even in, in low risk populations where let's say 3% or 4% of the people that are asymptomatic are testing positive now on, on surveillance testing. You know, the, you know, once you're getting to 20 or 30 or 40 people, I mean, the odds that everybody is going to be free of COVID is extremely low. So that if you go onto the airplane, so again, too, stay away from people, be very careful, don't touch your face. You go onto the airplane, you leave the mask on, you don't eat, you don't drink, um, um, uh, you know, wear glasses. I really think that that's something that's been, been de-emphasized, you know. And um, if you have to do something with your hands, make sure that you sanitize your hands, you wash your hands or use the alcohol gels and be as careful as you possibly can. Uh, but is it totally safe? Absolutely not. And I think that travel should be for essential things and not for fun. Um, someone has asked what your thoughts are on outdoor dining. Well, it depends on, it's, it's better than indoor, all right? But it depends on how close you are to people. And so, you know, I see in Manhattan, you know, the restaurants are doing outdoor dining because they made cabins, they made tents that people were sitting in very close to each other, all right, with heaters, okay? I mean, they're not outdoors. They're on the street, but they're not outdoors. I mean, just think about, think like a virus, you know? It's traveling in the air, it's droplet infections coming out of your mouth or your nose, or it's aerosols coming out of your mouth or nose. It's floating freely in the air. You know, uh, it, you know if, if, you're, if you're walking in the park and the wind is blowing, yeah, the concentration of virus is gonna be very low. But if you're in a semi-enclosed space, close to other people and you're eating and talking and not wearing a mask, obviously, you know, you're gonna have exposure. So that um, uh, you know, it's it's dangerous, and you have to accept the fact that it's dangerous, and you have to basically put that into your own thinking about whether you're willing to tolerate those dangers. 
Dr. Norton, I know we've gone over the hour, but there, do you mind taking a couple more questions? No, please, by all means. I, I won't happy. ask them all because there are so many, but um, okay. happy, 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 to, happy to do a few more. Yeah. To have you. Okay, terrific. So someone has asked the question, which I think is a very good one. If you anticipate that people would have to be revaccinated every year, like with the flu vaccine. We and, don't know. No, we, we, just don't know. Don't, we just don't know yet. I mean, okay. that's, that's, we're going to find out. I mean, there's going to be, you know, is, is that people are going to be getting regularly tested uh, you know, by the companies and we're going to find out. We just don't know yet. My daughter wants to know if kids have to get it. <laughs> um, you know, that's, that's a big area of discussion. It's, it's possible that, that it's possible not even to be vaccine. It's possible to stop at 18. In other words, that, that people older than 18 are going to be the ones that get the, at least the, the, the first virus, of, uh, the, first, the first vaccines. It's, not, it, it's still under active discussion. It, it really depends on what happens. And if the virus is dead, if the virus is gone, if it's eliminated from the earth, you're not going to have to worry about it, uh, you know, go, going forward. You know, um, uh, like smallpox, right? We don't sm do smallpox, you know, inoculations anymore. And the reason we don't is the smallpox is gone, um, and uh, and that kind of thing. So it all depends on on, on really what happens. Um, um, so we, but but probably the very last group of people that are going to be vaccinated are going to be children, because um, number one, they they don't get very sick, uh, very rarely, and number two is they're not very good at spreading it because they get better from so quickly. Um, so that's where they're finding that the schools are, are actually pretty safe uh, with the usual precautions in terms of distance and masks and whatever too. So we're not seeing super spreader events in the schools and they're using routine testing in the schools. And that's why um, most of us involved in public health think the bars and the restaurants should close way before the schools close. And, um, uh, and I hope that nothing closes, but you know, we'll have to see what happens in the next few weeks when we see the, uh, the consequences of Thanksgiving and the consequences of Christmas. Mm -hmm. Um, someone has asked if you recommend getting antibody testing after taking two doses of the vaccine. Um, that's, you know, um, it looks like, uh, we, we just had a discussion about this in one of the think tanks I'm involved in on the vaccines. It looks like the vaccine is so productive that we don't have to do that uh, from a public health point of view, all right, is that, um, uh, is that the likelihood you're not going to develop good antibodies is so low that it probably doesn't make sense to actually have to do a surveillance of the whole population. But, but there will be continued be surveillance of selected individuals as part of the research. We call it postmark. Remember that these vaccines are not approved yet. There is a, it's called an EUA, emergency youth or, authorization, so that the companies still have an obligation to, to study the people that are getting vaccinated. Uh, not all of them, but, but many of them. And so we'll, we'll find out whether, whether that is important. Or not. Similarly, um, if it turns out that in the surveillance we find out that getting vaccinated, you have vaccines for you, you're, you have antibodies for life, you're not going to have to get it every year. If it turns out that you are um, uh, that some people carry the, vac the the antibodies longer and other people don't, then we may have to get tested to find out whether you should get a, a vaccination. With the flu, we don't do testing because we do know that pretty much everybody has to be vaccinated again, and the reason for that is the flu is constantly mutating. So that every year's flu is different than the, than the flu the year before. Uh, if it was always the same flu, we would not have to go through that. Uh, and, and so far, this SARS um, virus doesn't seem to be, it is mutating, but it doesn't seem to be mutating in terms of anything that's really important like the, like the protein, like the spike protein that the, the vaccine is being developed to. So there may be, it may be very happy news that you may not have to be tested for antibodies and you may be protected for life. That, that's the best case scenario. Uh, but, but science will tell us the answer to that question and we'll know uh, and the public will be informed um, so that we'll be able to make rational decisions for ourselves. Um, someone has asked if they're asymptomatic, do you recommend any testing, either on regular uh, intervals or just at all? Um, only if you've been, if, if you're in a special circumstance, like, you know, you're going to work in a company or you're going, or you're a school teacher or you're going to school or something like that. So where well, you want to try to prevent major outbreaks, yes, as part of a public health maneuver. For your own individual decision-making, all right, um, it's, it, it, if you're asymptomatic and have not been exposed to COVID as far as you know, it doesn't make any sense to me that you would want to be tested because how are you going to use that information? Now, if you've been exposed to somebody who's a known COVID carrier, you know, then you do want to get tested because there's a reasonable chance that you'll test positive and then you're going to want to be basically quarantined, isolated for, it's turning out to be seven to 10 days now, not 14. Um, uh, you know, with, without symptoms before you can come back into the public. Because basically everybody should assume that everybody around them is infectious and, and, and stay six feet apart and wear a mask. Everybody should do that. And so whether you test, po you test positive 
you should be away from everybody. So testing positive is important, but if you test negative, it doesn't mean you should in any way relax. And it kind of drives me crazy where people are saying, you know, I'm having people over the house and it's totally fine because, well, two of them had COVID and everybody else tested negative. This is a super spreader event just waiting to happen for all the reasons I just described to you. Several people have asked if the vaccines will be safe for those who are immunosuppressed. Well, they'll be safe, but how effective they are, we don't know. So that may be a circumstance where we're going to have to either give bigger doses of the vaccine, such as we do now with the flu, where older people get a, a, a higher dose of, 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 the, uh, of the vaccine than younger people do, or we're going to have to test it to see if, if the um, antibodies, antibodies are raised. Um, what I've heard so far from the companies is they have people that fall into what's considered immunosuppressed groups that have gotten the vaccine and have raised good quantities of antibodies. So, you know, it's, it's really, really remarkable that the, the first tranche of vaccines that have come through are actually as effective as they are um, and seem to be as good as they are and as safe as they are. And as I say, as I mentioned, I ran through a whole long list of them. There's others coming down the pike that might be easier to take, might be just as effective. So it's not going to be any one vaccine. It's going to be a whole lot of them that are going to be available to us. Mm -hmm. um, several people have asked about your thoughts on what's happening specifically in New York City, and I was wondering if you could speak to um, what's going on in the hospitals here, if they're, if they're being stressed right now. Uh, we're not stressed yet, but the numbers are going up, mm -hmm. and, uh, and we're fully prepared for the possibility that at, at the rate at which the numbers are going up, we actually could be in another April kind of situation. We don't think it's going to be as bad as April because uh, there's more personal protective equipment uh, you know, that we have that's stored. People know better in terms of protection. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and we hope that the public will be better informed and therefore more compliant with public health. So we, 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 and, and we're also getting better at treating it. Um, uh, discoveries, uh, steroids, dexamethasone, for example, seems to be effective. That was discovered by, by scientific research. So um, we don't know how those antibodies are going to play out, but there, there's hope that the therapeutic antibodies that I mentioned are going to be are going to be useful in that regard. So we don't think it's going to be as bad as April, but it's still going to be really, really bad. Mm -hmm. And so you know we're all we're all right now, all of us are on high alert and close communication with each other. Um, speaking of treatments, normally we think of steroids um, as something that suppresses the immune system, but yet you mentioned dexamethasone right. as one of the main treatments for COVID, and I was wondering if you could speak to that a little bit. And then also, mm. um, there's been some question recently as to whether remdesivir is truly effective. I, I think a study came out questioning the effectiveness of remdesivir yeah. as well. Yeah, it's a, if it's effective, which I, you know, you, you, know, you got you to, I mean, time will tell. It, it's, not that, it's not very effective, to put it that way. Um, so it's not, it's not the definitive, you know, the definitive, you know, end to the problem. Take rid of the and you're all going to be fine. So it's not that as well. The reason for the steroids is this, um, and I just alluded to it. You can't cover everything in, you know, in, in, in the 40 minute lecture. I went, I went 10 minutes over. I was trying to do it in half an hour, but you can't mention anything. But the reason is this, is that the really, really bad part of COVID is something called cytokine storm. And that is that your, your immune system kills you. You, your immune system, which is so turned on, uh, you know, to kill the virus, all right, perhaps because you got a lot of virus, we call viral load, you're exposed to a lot of virus, and so your immune system really got turned on very, very rapidly, or I think because you have clonal hematopoiesis, that's my own theory, and, you know, which I mentioned to you earlier, is that you're in the older age group, or you have diabetes, or, or obesity, or, 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 for, or just normal people sometimes will have abnormal circulating white blood cells with, you know, in that regard is those, those white blood cells are very, what are called pro-inflammatory. They're very, they easily triggered into a hyperreactive kind of state. So your immune system kind of goes haywire and overreacts. And your immune system now starts to send out chemicals that cause difficulty breathing, difficulty with heart rhythm, difficulty with kidney function, difficulty with mental function. And that's called cytokine storm. And, uh, and, and is, is, is one of the more common reasons for overwhelming fatal uh, COVID. Um, and steroids, which suppress the immune system at that point, um, uh, are, 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 are therefore useful at decreasing that hyperstimulation immune system so you don't go on to die of, um, of, that, uh, of, of that cytokine storm situation. But so, so using them early doesn't make sense because you want your immune system to fight off the virus. But if there's any indications so that you're going into the cytokine storm phase, that's when they really are having the, uh, the greatest impact. And there's ways of measuring things in the blood called interleukins. 
uh, to see whether you're going into that phase. I hope that the clonomatopoiesis, you know, thing will pan out and that'll give us some indication, whatever too. Um, and that's when those drugs can, ha can hopefully be maximally effective. So, so the dexamethasone is an established treatment later on in the illness. Yeah, later on in the illness, right. Okay. Um, so one more question that someone asked is, is it safe to go to the dentist or to have an extraction? Right yeah, you know, we haven't seen, uh, dentists have been great, you know. I mean, I mean, I mean, dentists really are surgeons, you know, and they know how to, they, they know how to you know, do things in a sterile fashion. So the mask wearing, the eye protection, the gloves, you know, um, uh, you know, the, the, the verbal screening at the door, have you been in a, you know, are, are you coming to me, you know, were you in South Dakota yesterday, you know, I mean, that, that kind of thing, you know, um, you know, as well as, you know, checking for anybody's illnesses. So we really have not seen big problems with the dentist offices. And I haven't seen, I, I, I don't know in my own personal experience of a case that's been associated with that. And, um, and I think that, uh, that looking at the public health situation, we think that that's safe, but other things in medicine are safe. And this is the other thing that we didn't really mention. And I've spoken to, I've done other public seminars on this particular topic. If you do for a mammogram, get a mammogram. If you do for a colonoscopy, get a colonoscopy. I mean, postponing those things. I mean, being in a hospital or, or right now is one of the safest places you can be. I mean, in hospitals, we know how to be careful and we're all protected. You know, we're all wearing the appropriate garb, you know, and, um, uh, and seeing infections in a medical setting is extremely unusual, very, very rare. Medical personnel have one of the lowest incidences of positivity, you know, that we're seeing in the general population because they know how to be careful. So that, you know, people who are postponing, you know, things like cancer screening, for example, um, uh, you know, because of fear of COVID, I mean, that's not rational. And so we think it's extremely important that people do those things. And we're very, very worried that the, the diagnosis rate of many cancers has, has, has gone down, all right? And that, that isn't because COVID is curing cancer, that's because people have cancer and they're not presenting to us to, for us to take care of them. And so we're very, we're worried about kind of a tsunami of cancer cases uh, once people feel free to go to the doctor. You know, big, big breast masses, for example, colon cancers that are bleeding, you know, situations that, that may be less curable, and if they're curable, may require much more, more noxious treatments. So, so that's another very important public health message. Please don't put off, don't put off your, your, your screening for your health, your visits to your doctor, your visits to your dentist. Thank you, critically important. Um, somebody has asked if your blood type makes a difference in COVID severity. You know, there's a, there are rumors to that effect, and there's a lot of soft data on that, but it's not hard data. Mm -hmm. And if, if there is, um, and if it does have an effect, it's a very minor one. There's another one also is men and women. You know, as men get severe COVID more commonly than women do. Um, uh, and part of the reason is because of those comorbidities, you know, the smoking, the heart disease, the obesity, whatever. To, part of it, we don't really fully understand, uh, but the, the difference is not that big. So things that are kind of of interest scientifically, you know, are not all necessarily of interest to the individuals trying to protect themselves from an illness. Mm -hmm. um, somebody has asked, can we let our kids under 18 have somewhat normal social lives as long as they wear masks and social distance when they get home? No. I mean, you know, if you, you know, is, is that, you know, I mean, one of our, one of our common super spreader events is birthday parties, mm -hmm. children's mm -hmm. birthday parties. I mean, we're seeing, we're seeing, we're seeing that a lot. If they're going to be around other people, you know, they are going to be exposed, you know? And um, yeah, I mean, wearing the mask and social distancing at home is going to protect you to some degree, but, but it's not a guaranteed degree. Right. And I think that everybody has to be careful in all circumstances. And I, and I think that, that, um, uh, you know, so I say the schools are safe because the schools are very careful, but a bunch of kids getting together and having a party um, is, is a classical super spreader kind of event. And it's and is not something, listen, folks, the light is at the end of the tunnel here. I'm speaking to you directly. I don't know how many people are out there in this participation now, but the, the light is at the end of the tunnel. The vaccines are coming down the pike. We're getting better drugs. We're learning how to deal with this, you know. Uh, by next summer or next fall, certainly you're going to you, we'll have all the parties we want. But um, we just this is I mean you don't want to be the very last American to die of COVID, all right? Because of, of of getting sloppy with the things that we do know that work. This is a time to double down and be very very careful with all the public health things that we know about um, uh, while while the future is getting brighter because of the development of better therapeutics and better vaccines. Mm -hmm. So I had a question to ask you about underestimation. Um, earlier this week, I had a friend whose mother passed away and on the death certificate, it was listed as heart failure. But the next day, his sister, who's in her early 50s, was found unconscious in her apartment. Um, she had suffered from diabetes. And I said to him, was she tested for COVID? And sure enough, the COVID test results came back positive. So it's not 
unlikely that his mother might also have had COVID. And I was just curious um, what you think the underestimation is and maybe how many Americans in your thoughts have actually had COVID. You know, it's actually, it's actually yeah, yeah, you know, it's a very good point. You know, um, it, 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 may be, it may be as high as 10 times the number that we think, but most people think that it's at least twice or three times the number that we think. All right, because of unreported cases, because basically the only ones who get reported are patients, people that have um, testing that's positive in, in, in a legitimate kind of a laboratory. There's people with COVID who don't get tested. There's people with COVID where the tests are false negative. So that kind of thing too. So the, actually the biggest, the best measure, and I actually should have put that slide in, um, uh, you know, and make my whole lecture, a three hour lecture, you know, which is, you know, what, what it could have been, um, is, is the number of, of deaths that are occurring compared to the same time last year. And um, all, for, for all cause, what they call all cause mortality, all right? And if you look at all cause mortality, you know, um, it is much, much greater than the deaths from COVID. So that people are dying like, of, like heart attacks because they're not getting to the hospital in time or the hospital can't take care of them, you know, that's happening too. But probably a lot of other people that are dying of things that we think of, you know, deaths from pneumonia, deaths from heart disease, are really are COVID, but they're not being coded as such. So that's a really very good point. The, the, the problem may be, the problem looks really terrible, but the problem may be even worse than what we see for exactly the reason that you mentioned. Someone's asked if you would recommend air purifiers in one's personal home. Yes. Yeah, the good HEPA filters do make a difference. Um, uh, you know, again, to everything adds up. It's not any one thing. You know, if I wear a HEPA filter, I can have people over and without wearing masks and have dinner. This doesn't work like that. But everything that you can do um, uh, to, 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 to clean your air. Now, if indeed nobody's going to your home but you and you're locked in there, but, but you know, sometimes people do have access you know, to the home, you know, coming in for various reasons, repairs or deliveries or whatever too. So it, it doesn't hurt to be safe. And so, and so um, offices in particular are putting in air filtration systems, but I think, I think it's reasonable to have them in the homes as well. Okay, and maybe one final question. Um, there's been really a, a bruising debate in the political arena about COVID from the beginning. And I was just curious if you think that the credibility of the CDC and even the FDA has been damaged um, during of the underlying Ra issue. Yeah, Rachel, I'm losing you. Um, uh, I, can without you without um, casting any blame, I, I, I couldn't hear your whole question. Your, 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 I'm so sorry. Your, your, I was just audio. saying that, yeah, I was saying that there's been this bruising debate in the political mm. sphere about COVID um, from Listen, the beginning. I, I, I'll say, I want to stay as far away from politics as possible. Everything I'm talking about so far is science and medicine, and that's really one of, what I want to focus in on, all right? Um, uh, I, I will tell you that Tony Fauci and I were together at the National, at the National Institute of Health. He was a few years, uh, you know, ahead of me. I mean, uh, there's no finer public servant and there's no finer person and there's no more brilliant person that, that I've met in my entire life. And the government is filled with people that are like that, that are really dedicated public servants who sacrificed their whole life economically, certainly, um, uh, you know, to be able to stay in government service. And we have a lot of those really wonderful people there. And uh, we, we need those voices to be heard and, um, and, uh, and, 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 and to listen carefully. Uh, as uh, as uh, they, they go through, and the government's done. I mean, I think the FDA, in terms of what it's done with the development of vaccines, really has been commendable. There's been a lot of commendable things that have been that, that have happened, you know, you know, going forward. And my full expectation is there'll be more of that going off into the future. Uh, but I don't want to specifically get into any kinds of political issues. You know, um, knowing who to trust is, is a very important part of life. All right, uh, you know, in, in this regard. And, um, and I think that we do have to, you know, there are such things as experts and, and we do have to trust our experts, uh, identify them properly and trust them. And if anybody has a question of who to believe, just ask me, I'll tell you. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Yeah. We're already looking forward to your next appearance when hopefully <laughs> we'll be looking backwards um, mm -hmm. on this situation and, mm -hmm. and have it behind us. Um, but it's really wonderful to hear from you with your insight and expertise about what's happening on the front lines in New York City and beyond. Um, we thank you very much for your time. And with that, I'll turn it back to the rabbi. Thank you so much, Rachel. And thank you so much, Dr. Norton, uh, for that. Uh, honest and a very real assessment of, of the situation. I think as time goes by, people begin to get lax or overconfident, and you most definitely uh, opened our eyes uh, to remain vigilant. 
Um, being that you mentioned that um, for most of us, the vaccine won't be available for quite some time, I just uh, have a couple of uh, additional questions in terms of the day-to-day, -day, uh, in terms of uh, remaining um, careful. So in terms of the, the common uh, masks that people are wearing that are not medically grade masks, uh, you see different comments in the news about them. Mm. Do they provide a real protection or should we go around you know, finding the real ones? Well, the real ones, the, the, there's pros and cons to the real ones. So the N95s are the best ones. Uh, I don't have one on my desk here, but I'll show you what. The N95s are the best ones. With the N95s too, you can't wear the ones that have the valves in front because that's, that's the air is getting out. They're more comfortable to wear, but you have to wear, wear the full ones. Those ones we're wearing in the hospital, we're in contact with COVID patients. When we're not in contact with COVID patients, we're re wearing regular surgical masks, uh, you know, which are those thin paper masks. But those, those are only, those are one use only. You wear them and you throw them away. And so there's a tremendous amount of wastage that goes like that. So that the cloth masks are very good. Some are better than others. I think the general rule is if you can see light through it, it's not good. Um, so uh, with two or three layers of cotton, they seem to be very good. And actually the ones that are thicker like that, um, and you got to cover your nose, you got to cover your mouth, all right? Uh, the best ones have a little bit of, uh, of metal there so they can pinch around the nose and so your glasses don't fog and they, and they, and they hold, hold it in in, the, in that particular regard. Um, the better ones are as good as the surgical masks, all right, it turns out, all right? And there's just so many on the market now, so many excellent ones on the market, you know, you just pick the one that you like the best. Um, uh, the cotton is good. It seems that silk is very good. There's a lot of very good materials that, that are out there. But basically, the rule is if you can see light through it, it's no good. And make sure that it covers your nose and, and your mouth. And remember that it's, 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 it's a coupling. You know, you want to have a mask and the person you're talking to wants to have a mask. Um, um, if, if, if that works, it's actually um, pretty much as good as a vaccine. Um, you know, they're, they're, uh, they're probably about 70% effective, and that, that means that, um, uh, you know, you're getting into the 90% protective range if you're both wearing it. And it's actually, you know, it's pretty much as good as a vaccine if you're both wearing masks. Now, obviously, we don't want to wear masks all of our lives, and we want to eat in restaurants, and, you know, we want to have a, a full congregation davening together, you know, and praying and singing. And I think, I think we want to return to that kind of, that kind of normal, normal life. And, um, and so we need these vaccines. But really, the masks do work. And as I say, is that um, um, this virus is not as, it's not measles. You know, measles is, you know, incredibly contagious, all right? If, if coronavirus were measles, you know, it, 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 we'd have tens of millions of people dead from it, okay, in terms of the contagion. It's not that contagious, really, truly. Um, uh, you know, one infected person usually infects two other people but then two affect two others and so on. So two, four, six, eight, 12, that's how you, that, you know, 16. I mean, that's how you get into, 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 into very, very large numbers. So it isn't that hard to protect yourself. It truly is not that hard to protect yourself. And if everybody just followed the social rules as they did in many Asian countries, you know, you go to Singapore, you know, you go to, and in many places, Hawaii's done very well with this. It's because people basically are following the rules, you know, and uh, you know, um, in most parts of Canada have done very well with this. If people just social distance, wear the mask, you know, wash your hands, you know, minimize, you know, don't go into crowds, you know, um, that kind of thing too. I mean, that works. And that's what's so frustrating when I see a map that, 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 that is just exploding all over the place with cases and, and, and overwhelming hospitals and overwhelming deaths. It, it wasn't that hard for us to get on top of this if we did the right thing. And we still have to do the right thing, but certainly the vaccines are going to help a lot. Thank you. And you also mentioned the um, prolonged exposure and people are talking about 15 minutes uh, right. exposure. But if at the end of the day, it, it can uh, transfer just through a basic conversation, shouldn't any incidental contact, even for a few seconds, you know, in theory, be a, a real risk? Yes. Yes. But, you know, it, 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 becomes, it becomes, you know, it, it, it's, it's just a matter of playing odds, you know. I mean, you know, I mean, you know, if you play Russian roulette all day, the odds are your uh, bullet's going to come out. If you play it once, it's, you know, you win five, you, you win, you know, five times out of six, you know, so, you know, but is it wise to play Russian roulette? No. So, you know, do I, have there people that have been extremely careful, but have had one casual exposure, you know, um, somebody that, somebody that, that I work with has been extraordinarily careful and let her guard down and actually hug somebody one time for a few seconds. Okay. Um, on greeting somebody who she hadn't seen for a long time. And then she realized, oh my God, and backed off from it, all right? And, there, and, and, and she, she caught COVID from that one, that one hug. So I think that, that the fact of the matter is, is it's a matter of the odds. So when they're saying 15 minutes, and it's not, it used to be 15 continuous minutes, now it's just says 15 minutes total. 
you know, expose, expose the serum, you know, one minute, 15 times, you know, is enough to sort of do it. But that's just a matter of odds. Could you get it with one exposure? Absolutely. It's a virus. It doesn't care about these rules. So once it gets into your nasal system, once it gets into your mucosa, it's going to replicate, which means it's going to divide and it's going to, and, and, and it's going to do its dirty work. So yeah, you want to minimize all exposure and you've got to be really compulsive about it. And if you're compulsive about it and you're careful, you're not only helping yourself, but everybody you love and you're helping the whole nation, you're helping the whole world. So I think it's an obligation. It's an absolute obligation to, uh, to be careful and not spread, this, not spread this disease any further. Okay, thank you. And one last question for this evening. Um, you, you presented the different types of uh, vaccines that are going to come out and you yourself mentioned that you would just take whichever one's offered to you uh, first. Um, do you foresee uh, people taking multiple vaccines from different companies? Um, we don't, no, I don't, I, I think that's gonna be unlikely because by the time the vaccines go for phase three testing, uh, they, they're all going to be good enough uh, that uh, that you're probably not going to have to have to get have to get them going forward. But if it turns out that you're going to have to get revaccinated because your antibody levels drop over time, uh, then then the ones that are going to be the most convenient, uh, the ones that go by skin patch or intranasal or nasal spray or nasal drops, you know, the ones that maybe even the oral ones. There are several of them developed that are actually going to be in pill form or a liquid that you can drink. Those are going to be the ones that are probably going to be the dominant ones, you know, years hence if people need. To be uh, to to be revaccinated, so so we still have a lot of unanswered questions, and that's that's the one thing about science, which I think I want to sort of emphasize. Um, you know, no scientist say, will ever say they have all the answers. You talked about humility before. I mean, it's an essential ingredient to being a good scientist. You, you know, you, you you have to question everything, and um, and uh, and and you're going to make mistakes. You're going to say things that 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 you have to modify at a later date, but you will modify them and sort of stick with these things. There's a lot that we don't know. We're very humble about that. All right. But we're also very confident that we have the systems in place to learn the answer to these questions and to constantly evolve our state of knowledge so that we'll be able to answer these questions better as we move off into the future. So, so, so humility is a very important part of gathering knowledge. Okay, thank you so much once again. You know, as Rachel mentioned, this is your third presentation, right. which means that there's one more for the quarter, which we uh, look forward to uh, <laughs> sometime in the future. Well, pleasure, pleasure to do it. Thank you for inviting me back all these times. And, th and thank you to all my friends out there who are listening. Thank you all. Yeah, and, uh, and when, please God, that it's all over, we definitely want to invite you to the shul. You, uh, you'll have many fans that are going to okay. want to meet to you during the Kiddush. Ab uh, absolutely. My, my, my honor and my pleasure, my privilege. Thank you so much. Thank you so much once again. And we remind everyone that it's a, it's a sacred Torah value, not only to guard your health, and, but to guard other people's health, health. And this is one of the great values of the, of the Torah. It's, uh, it overrides almost every single law in the Torah to guard your health, to guard other people's health. So please remember to be, to be responsible and to be safe. That is the main thing. Thank you all for joining us and have a wonderful and safe week and a happy Hanukkah to everyone. As happy Hanukkah. Hanukkah. Please God, the light of Hanukkah will, will usher in uh, this Thursday night. Thank you. Bye -bye.